All right, guys, well, we're going to get started. Just to introduce myself, I'm Carla, and I'm the marketing manager here at Fuse Forward. I'd like to welcome you to the fifth episode of our webinar series, Remote Control. Um, I'm working from home here today, and as I'm sure many of you are, uh, but we do know that working from home isn't always a possibility for people that are working in critical infrastructure or highly secure um, industries. So that leads us into our topic today, which is running critical infrastructure from home. Is it possible? Leading the discussion today, we have Mark Dam. He is a skilled systems architect with over 25 years experience leading the implementation of um, complex IT systems for a range of industries, including cities, facilities, and utilities. So I'm really looking forward to the session today and I know everyone else is here. Um, so I won't take any more of your time. Let's get started, Mark. All right, appreciate it, Carla. Can you hear me uh, good, Carla? Uh, yes. You're always my test bed for this. <laughs> no, and it's are you able? Does everybody able, are you able to see my screen right now? Yes. All right, well, thank you everyone. Welcome to uh, another edition of Remote Control. Um, this is one of our, uh, our bi-weekly and in some cases monthly uh, monthly sessions that we provide um, on different topics related to intelligence systems, cloud computing, application systems, and all the things that are required uh, in order to keep our infrastructure working and operating. Um, what we were gonna talk about today is critical infrastructure. So can you run it from home? So, you know, I, I work from home right now. Um, we actually have operation centers, network operations and cloud operation centers in various places as well. And the only thing that we kind of look at is, well, what's the best way that we can actually go through and try and manage all of these different environments today? So as an example, are you able to go through and run an environment? And what we want to do is I want to ask a couple of questions first. What is the biggest operational challenge you are facing right now as part of COVID-19? So we're gonna have a little poll here and this will kind of help us gauge a little bit as to what some of the challenges are you have. Is it staff availability? Is it on-site dependency, remote access to your applications? Do you have a slow network connection? Do you have delayed maintenance work where maintenance work isn't being done on your facilities? What about your delivery of services? Or are you not facing any challenges at all? Are you able to work from home? Can you, I will give it a minute and everybody else can vote now. So it looks like remote access to applications is the, the leading um, issue here. I'm gonna remote share access the results. to applications, which by far is 26%. And what we see on some of the other ones is your dependency on being on, side, on site, uh, coupled with bandwidth and slow network connections. Well, can we solve slow network connections? We'll talk to that today. Can we deal with how to access remote applications? Absolutely. Can we also look at the things that you can do in order to be on site to actually go and do that? Um, we're gonna address some of those too. So let's see what we can do today to go through and see what we can do and talk through some of these issues. So let me share a little bit. You know, I've been working in this industry for about 30 years, long time. Uh, worked with big utility companies, worked with small local governments, worked with water systems, electric systems, gas systems, on campus environments. And we've always run into similar questions all the time. How can we go through and secure all of our systems? And typically the model, the model that we've been following for security is to put barbed wire up, put big concrete blocks and make sure nobody gets into our power plants, nobody can get into our water treatment facilities and that we have cameras and security guards all around it. But what happens is, is another challenge is as we start moving more and more to basically having internet enabled or let's call it network enabled operating systems like your real time controls, we have to go through and say, okay, well, can I now go through and remote manage some of these remote facilities? So a large oil and gas company that I worked with at one point in time, all of the pump stations were 100 miles, 140 kilometers apart. And so in order to go and get a field crew in to go and do maintenance work had, was a logistical challenge. You had to fly them in by helicopter, which basically means we wanted to do remote management of those sites. So we had to put in bandwidth. And in the past, bandwidth was very slow. So it was 9,600 KB, not megabits per second, not, not gigs. It was KB. So it was enough to go through and send little readings. And that was about it. Now, the other challenge we see operationally today is 
we've seen many cases where when we still want to get people accessing into systems, we start running into the systems on the receiving end don't have enough network connectivity or what we call virtual private networks connections to allow that to happen. So how can we manage that challenge as well? And then of course, many cases when we start looking at remote sites and managing them, even if they're water treatment plants, the technical skills local may not have all the deep engineering expertise required to actually go through and repair equipment. So they may, may need some remote support in order to go through and handle those operational challenges. In this COVID-19 situation, as an example, what we've seen over the last three months is that these are now expanded on a much larger basis where not, it's not now a case of a handful of people in one local region with one, one critical area being challenged, but it's the whole world being challenged. So now we've got this massive influx of people using networks, people using more and more bandwidth, still the requirement to keep social distancing inside the control center. So how are people addressing this? What are some of the ways that the utilities are navigating through this challenge today? So there's a great story from uh, New York State, New York City, Reuters, Reuters put it out. One of the biggest challenges in order to keep their infrastructure running, they're basically allowing their line workers to sleep on site. So they're putting beds there, they're creating food, they're spreading everybody apart. So there's two meters or six and a half feet of distance between people. And so they're creating an environment which is a crisis situation environment, similar to when we have a, an earthquake. It, it, is a, it is a very significant event. But those events are, are, are ones that we can deal with on a month basis or week basis or, or a shorter time window. But it becomes part of the norm and you have to start doing it on month after month, year, year after year. You have to start coming up with alternative ways of doing it. So we start looking and say, is there other ways that we can challenge this? What are some of the things that we need to do in order to start affecting some of these systems, get access to the systems that we need access to? Can you, instead of putting everybody inside a central facility, can we distribute out the management of this into different ways? We're gonna talk through some of the options that we have today to go and do that. So let's kind of go through and look at some of the systems that you need and a utility operates from. So, you know, I always think of the control room. The control room is where all of it happens. I've been into power plants where the controller goes in, puts his hand up against the uh, vibrations of the uh, turbine system and says, I need to go and tune that turbine. And that's the way that we've been tuning water pipe, water turbine systems in the past. Uh, it's got a sound, a harmonics that people are listening to. It also has basically a vibration that you're, lit, that you're feeling when you're in the plant. And so you can start changing the speed of the turbine in order to get the harmonics within range and get the vibration down so that it's actually becoming more and more efficient. So that's what our control systems are. They're very local, they're within the facility. And in some cases for those oil and gas companies or those electric grids that are remote, we still then go through and feed all that information back into a couple of centralized facilities where we consolidate all that information and we have multiple screens together. Within the control, control room, there's also another area, which is your engineering systems, bottom right-hand side. So not only do we have our operators running day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute, we also have our engineers that are looking at these things and say, okay, now let me go and look at the predictive and preventative maintenance management systems I'm looking at, my EAM systems. And let me start looking at different things that I can do to help basically make sure that we are doing our repairs in the right order, or maybe we have a major shutdown in one of the systems and we have to go and do and coordinate all of that work related to preventative and predictive maintenance to make sure that everything is going to continue to operate. In a crisis situation, we turn off and say, we're not doing any maintenance. But as soon as we start getting into that model of trying to go through and say, we're going to have to do this for three months, six months or 12, we've got to start planning for how we're going to do maintenance management, how we're going to do all of our project work. And then when we start getting into it, how are we going to start dispatching all the field crews, whether that's a dispatch of a crew to a local environment, whether it's to do our, our street management and all of our safety procedures, whether it's going up a telephone pole or an electric pole to go through and manage a transformer. We've got all of those issues that we need to address and all those different systems that have to come together 
And if I look at my screen right now, I, I was shutting down all my applications before I got on this, on this session. And I had to shut down about 10 different applications when I was here because I actually work from home and I have secure connectivity to a lot of things. So how can we go through and now get access to all these systems and be able to go through and now manage a power generation plant, a dispatching, a, a, a field, a, a field a pump station for water, wastewater, or some sort of transformer station in, electric, in an electric distribution grid. So what are some of the methods we can use? So three things that we kind of think of as, as an evolution of where we go. We currently sit in the world where we centralize everything and we have little cables that go out and give us information back and we do some remote monitoring, but remote monitoring today is all done centrally. We do have some mechanisms where we can go in because they're on secure private networks. The utility keeps these networks all within something that they run the physical wires that control it. And we do some remote control. We're able to go and set set points on some of our systems using our supervisor control, our SCADA systems or our building management systems. And as we start seeing this, we've got more and more capabilities of using robotics and autonomous control. So there's your evolution. I got another poll for you. This is a little question for everybody. What's your basic technical challenge right now that you're that, that is challenging? What is the basic technical challenge for remote work has posed for your staff and colleagues? Security, bandwidth, remote access to applications, which we've heard already, um, hardware and equipment so that somebody can actually use the stuff at home. Are you not facing any challenges at all? Oh, sorry, let's move on to the second one. Is there a second one? Yeah, no. Uh... No, this is, a, this is it. Okay. Um, okay, there's just some questions coming in. So it's what work from home challenges, technical challenges have posed the biggest, um, what technical concerns have posed the biggest challenge. Um, I'll share it when the results are in. There's still some more coming through. Can everyone see, the, see those? It looks like security concerns. 25% of people um, are concerned about security. Security is the biggest one. Well, that's a perfect segue into the next questions that we're going to go and drive through. How do we provide security? How do we go through and get access to the applications, which was poll number one, and how do we secure and manage all that security down, especially when we're driving and thinking about all those control situations. So let's take a scenario. I'm going to walk us through a little bit of what we would consider an approach to go through and solve this problem. So imagine for a minute now that you can't get to the emergency, the control room, that centralized facility where we do dispatch is down. Let's also assume that the secondary, the backup is also down. Okay, one of them got hit by, uh, one, one of them got hit by a flood, so you can't get into it. The other one is in a situation where there was an outbreak of an illness and everybody in there can't go in because there's too much contamination and, and everybody's getting sick, okay? So how would we run all of our infrastructure systems? What would I need to see on my monitor at home? How would I be able to control those systems? How would I make sure that the environment and as me behind the desk touching the keyboard instead of, for example, my child or my dog, okay? And that I am the one that's actually gonna go through and, being, and, and basically navigating through all the different pieces. So what are the different ways that we can do that? So let's first look at the things that we need to consider. So I, I, I think of this as the Fuse Forward Virtual Operations Center. So we think of it as, as an environment where you can bring all your different applications together into one central dashboard of looking at it all. So I did a project for a large university campus and they were running a water treatment system, a wastewater treatment system, a steam generation plant, a healthcare facility on campus, um, they were managing a transportation network and they managed all the buildings for all the student residences. Interestingly enough, they had an operator in a control room in, on campus and his job was to monitor 11 different systems. And the way he kept on top of everything is he had a chair and he scrolled back and forth with his chair between 11 different monitors on 11 different systems, responding to alerts and alarms on each one of them. Nowadays, we start saying, well, okay, can we bring that together into a virtual sense? So yes, we can. 
But if I'm now looking at it and I'm saying dealing with the most complicated one where it, it is a campus environment or a city scale or even a, a nation scale system where it's an energy grid and lots of distribution networks and lots of power generation facilities coupled with water, wastewater, and then all of the field crews that are driving on the roads, what do I need to see? Well, I, as an operator inside that environment to deal with that emergency is I'm gonna need access to a GIS map a map that kind of shows me all the different places that the utility lines are, where the field crews are located at any point in time, what might be down there in the way of, of hazardous equipment. I'm gonna need over on the left-hand side, something maybe on another screen, which would be my building blueprints. So the setup that you're seeing here, um, and then of course in the middle is my working desktop. Now the GIS map might be fine on a 24 inch monitor, the, the blueprints might be good on a vertically monitor, on a vertical monitor, 24 inches, so I can navigate through it. And then I've got this big active working screen. Now, what I have in my getup here right now, just to validate this, is I've got a 36 inch monitor in the middle here. And I have virtual screens on top of that that allow me to drill down into different applications. Now, there's a number of challenges when we start bringing those different pieces together. One of the key challenges that we're going to look through, and we're going to talk to four different ones. How do we handle user access, as an example? How do we make sure that these applications are secure? And then once we, we have access to those, how do we start managing through the different scenarios of remote monitoring, remote control, and then handling new forms and what are the new future capabilities of, of autonomous control? Okay, so let's go through each one. Let's talk about user access for a minute. So yeah, this looks, this is not me. He's got hair, I don't. Um, he's got coffee, I don't right now, unfortunately. But you'll notice he's got three monitors, kind of the setup. The one in the middle is usually the one you want us to be a bigger monitor. Now he's probably using his laptop right now to connect into these using a docking station. If you're working from home and you're trying to set up a virtual operations environment, what we call a virtual operations center, then the key thing that you wanna be looking at is not necessarily using internet connected devices. Okay, so how do we get around internet connected devices? One way to do that is to put a private network connection in place. And a private network connection can be one of two things. It can be a virtual private network connection or it can be a physical private network connection. So in our operation at our, at our distributed op centers, we use physical and they're smaller rooms with room to have four people, and we can spread them out into many different regions and many different cities and neighborhoods. And each one of those has a physical connection, which is a private network link to a cloud hub. Okay, and I'll get to that in a minute as I go through a little bit on that. So that's one of the key things is how do we do that? From my home-based environment, I actually have a specific firewall device, and it's a, it's a company firewall. And that company firewall is managed by our security team and it creates a secure connection between my home system and the one in our, in our network aggregation point. And that's a separate firewall. So it's a physical firewall, not one on my PC, but a physical firewall device that's a small little device. So that small device now goes through and gives me the connection. Attached to it, we then start looking and say, well, what can we do to drive these different monitors? So the different monitors, one of the key things we use today is what we call a virtual desktop with a device that sits on that environment, on that disk, desk, which doesn't actually have a CPU in it. It's got a small CPU, but it, does, it doesn't have storage. And it actually runs a desktop that's actually in a secure environment in a data center, as opposed to using the PC. So now, how do I got? So now I've got a secure device with a firewall connected into a, an aggregation point in my environment, either in the cloud or a private cloud node in my network within the utility. And that gives me the ability to access into that environment. Now, of course, the key challenge is, is if we're, sorry, if we're coming back right now, we're trying to say, well, how do we go through and make sure that we've authenticated the user? Okay, multi-factor authentication. I'm on a camera right now and camera has the ability to do biometrics. Um, I can even use my fingerprint down on the keyboard and have a keyboard fingerprint reader or handprint reader. 
all of those are devices that are actually used in some cases inside physical operation centers today. Well, you can duplicate that technology at home. What else can you do? Well, we can also go through and create, there's new technology out there. We, we've kind of been working with a security company that has this, which allows us to do keyboard monitoring. And of course, everybody says, well, that's what a hacker does. It's keyboard loggers. Well, because we know that the technology is available, if you think about hackers doing keyboard logging, well, that's what they're doing. But there's, once you've got that pattern, what you do now with using new kind of machine learning techniques is using an algorithm, you're able to go through and get a person's specific pattern of typing. That means that you can validate that the person typing on the keyboard with their key presses on the fingers is typing in a manner that it's them. That means that if your dog goes through and accidentally hits the keyboard, can't do it. It won't, it won't recognize it because it's not that person typing and it's not following that pattern. Similarly, if your child is in there, they're usually going, going J, 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 K, 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 and they just like to hit keys. Again, it's not the pattern, so it won't accept the keyboard input. So those are new ways. So what you've got to look at is, how do I make sure and put a camera on that device so that I'm using biometrics? How do I make sure that my keyboard is the keyboard who it is? And then instead of using this laptop, how do we use a virtual desktop out there so that that's our primary mechanism to go through and access? So we've now gone through, we've authorized the site, we've authorized the user, we've authorized the work from home. The other way to go and continue to do that is there's new techniques out here. I have white walls. And if you go through, you can actually go and expand these monitors to actually project on a white wall. And that's using new techniques out there, which is now, it's almost like presentation videos instead of a TV screen. You can just do it as a small little projector that comes up and it's a small little device that comes on. Now you might say, well, these are really expensive pieces. Well, the prices for all of that technology has dropped significantly. Everything I just described, including these video conferencing services, if I was to do this 10 years ago, we'd be talking tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. To put this set up today that I just described is $1,000 or maybe $2,000 to go and put all that together. It's the price of a laptop computer, a high-end laptop computer. And you can put that together and then manage it so that it's always accessing a virtual desktop in an environment so that you're not actually using the physical device at home. Okay. So what other things can we do here? So that kind of gets us into the user access. And on that user access, we also have other ways like making sure that we've got the white, we, we've got an IP management. So we know that the internet protocols or the the, the ways of identifying all the devices that are attaching are all within a range that we've set up and we don't allow any third parties in. All right, let's talk about monitoring alerts and alarms then. So how does this all work? So one of the key things that we've got right now is, and I'll, I'll share a little bit because we're working on a project right now with a university, a, a large university campus in downtown Toronto. I'll get to that case study in a little while. But part of what we've got is we've got instrumentation out here current methods, I always love everybody talking about IoT. And they say the internet of things is all brand new. And I'm like, well, actually, we've been working with supervisory control systems using analog and digital analog technology for about 35 years. It's not that new. In the industrial world, we've been doing signal processing, but we've been using it using analog signals. So we're now using digital signals. We're getting more of them. Uh, we're learning how to calibrate. We're becoming inundated with significant amounts of data. So that gives us more and more capability. And these devices out here in the instrumentation side are becoming controllable using internet protocols. We heard on one of the polls, security is a concern. Yep, I would agree. And this one, one of the largest uh, uh, breaches in, in North America was Target when they had a, a, a customer data being stolen and it was all hacked, but it was never really hacked because the hacker actually gained security credentials from a technician, an HVAC technician when, went out into the field and they left the back door open. So if we look at it, how do we not even, how do we lock all these down? So our instrumentation systems need to be on separate private networks they need to be a one-way feed into a system where the SCADA operator can monitor and see the alerts and alarms. What they're gonna do at the end of the day is start looking at monitoring systems which might trigger a response. Now, how do we go? Do we want the control system to automatic, automatically respond? Well, it does. 
if you think about how your HVAC system works in your, in your, uh, in your office, we, ha we, set, we create set points for heat and temp for, for temperature and we got our cooling and our heating settings and the systems automatically turn on and turn off within the range that we've specified. So that's already a stage of autonomous control. Our HVAC systems turn on and turn off, okay, based upon what we create for set points. We're actually doing a project right now and we've already got dynamic set pointing where we've got machine learning algorithms being deployed to go and dynamically change the set points based upon new machine learning algorithms. So that's the new world. That's that whole area of now autonomous control. So do we want our skate operator to allow us to go and change those control systems? Well, we just talked about the skate operator being on a secure system or a secure environment. So if their system from home is secure, then they can try and start doing these control system adjustments. So the key things that we wanna be able to do is determine and manage the SCADA operator and make sure that they can do the monitoring. Monitoring is easy because then what we start saying is who can they go through and dispatch to the site to actually make changes. And so now we wanna go and dispatch it. So new techniques that we have for managing that first stage of evolution, SCADA operators don't give them access to change the systems, let them read all the instrumentation inputs, let them monitor all the alarms, alerts and alarms. And then what they can do is get on the phone, get on a camera, put a sound camera on the top of a remote worker and monitor what they're doing when they're on site. Then you're decreasing the amount of people that need to be on site and we're just handling a dispatching mechanism with a control desk in front of us, okay? All right, what about controlling the remote systems? I love this picture because you wanna know, look at how many people are in the operating site, and how many screens they have. Wow, I love those screens. Those are my kind of screens. And that's a lot of different geography. That's Southern California down there in a lot of cases. They're probably looking at the power grid. They're looking at spikes. They're looking at what the kind of needs are gonna be. They've got different camera feeds coming in and they're being able to monitor all kinds of different things during situational analysis environments. So, what we've got to really look for right now is in a controlling the remote systems, how can you scope and dispatch the field crews to address the alarms? Can you create an environment similar to this environment down here with that worker and give them enough screens at home to go and do that? Well, you got to have a big enough office at home, right? Now, the beauty is in certain areas, especially in North America, people live in the suburbs and the suburbs have, in, in some cases, small little mall areas or little remote offices that are really low cost where you can set up a secure network connection and put a little room together with smaller little offices that you can still put biometrics into, okay? The other thing that we have is we have the ability also to go through and do the same sort of thing at home. How can we go through at home and put that kind of piece together to allow a worker to go through and still get some version of this, but maybe a smaller version to work at home on that same environment. So the controlling mechanism is what do I need to see on the screen? I need to see a dispatch. So what I need to do is I need, sorry, I keep hitting my, my mouse here. We want to go through and be able to see on the screen the geography for the dispatch. We're gonna need a headset on so that we can make phone calls to folks. And we're gonna to want to go through and dynamically see where the different vehicles are out there with GPS signals that sit on top of all the trucks. So that's part of our process for going through and managing that. Can that all be done at home? Yes, it can. Can we address alerts and alarms? Well, this is where the new techniques like virtual reality come into play uh, or augmented reality, where there's a set of glasses that a technician or a field worker can use. And then the person working at home that is a high skilled individual can actually go through and help them go through and manage um, what's going on inside the field environment and provide additional, additional advice and lookups on the screens that they're doing that. Now, what's interesting is you might say, well, this is not possible. Well, it is. And actually, I'm gonna give you an example as we go along here of one of the case studies that we're actually running today where we actually do have a remote operations going on. We have, a, we have remote environments that are doing this and we're actually running these kind of environments and we have a DR scenario, disaster recovery scenario, to actually go through set up and use these virtual desktops in case the local sites are all down. Now, where's all this going? We got remote, we've got, we've got monitoring, which is easy. 
we just have to go and share data and make sure there's no ability to access to update. Remote control, now we're gonna change it. So you only wanna do that on secure networks and you still might want to go through and have remote hands. Now, as we start moving to the new world, this world that we start seeing today, we start looking at robotics and autonomous control. So this all exists. If I go into a water, a water system and I wanna go through and do an inspection on my water lines, my main lines, I actually put a robot down and I basically control it remotely to go through and determine uh, any of the leaks inside the water pipe. So we have autonomous robots. Um, we basically have uh, Fukushima, uh, Fukushima power plant, when we had the uh, nuclear power plant meltdown, they actually have been using robots to go on site, remotely controlled, in order to go through and investigate it because it's too much of a hazardous environment for the actual workers to go into. So can we control those from home? Yes, we can. So now all of a sudden we can take that device and we can control it using any type of augmented reality or in some cases it's a gaming, it's a gaming console, you know, similar to something like this, where you basically have a gaming handset that you can be using to control that device out in the field. It's like a drone. And you guys have, many people have probably seen the drones and how we're basically sitting in a secure facility in order to go through and fly the drones. Okay, robotic roadworks and excavation. Well, again, the same way, instead of going into it and trying to protect workers out in the street, we start doing other kinds of methods where we wanna create a more safe environment. And instead of putting a person in harm's way, we basically are using robots to go through and do the remote hands that that worker can do it. So you can start creating that social distancing. You can now securely control from home using a remote worker that could be using a robot. So now we're starting to get into a mixed hybrid model. More and more with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're moving more into autonomous control methods. So if we go into a manufacturing plant, many of the capabilities in the manufacturing plant today are already using automated control methods to go through and do production lines. We can take that same techniques, those same components and put them into different environments. The key thing around it is to wrap it in the security, make sure it's only not using the public internet, it's using private network connections and control all of the access methods going into those environments, okay? user access, system access, and, and all of the other things that we wanna track and monitor. So I always like this one. So SpaceX just launched. They went in and got launched and connected into the uh, International Space Station. And their method, you know, I, I saw a screen, we were sharing it on our Slack channel in the office the other day. And the, the, the beauty about this was the change from the 1980s through to 2020, where we've moved from a lot of knobs to touch screens to go through and do things with a lot more of autonomous control. So in this environment, it's a button that says, link me now. And the computer takes care of calibrating the, the spaceship to link in and dock with the space station. And there's a little bit of fine tuning, but even on a screen, they're using a touch screen to go through and basically charge the thrust, thrusters and move them around or using the, the different pieces. Again, looking at all those kids that are playing with game consoles today and playing with these spaceships um, uh, machine or spaceship games, they're doing, just, they're doing this as well with their game controllers. So you're starting to see the fact that our gaming infrastructure is now linking in to the way that we're actually physically physically managing tech, the same control technologies today as well. So I'm about halfway through here, about 35, 35 minutes into it. Let's get into a little bit of some of the scenarios. I've talked about some of the challenges. Now, everybody mentioned, how do we maintain security compliance? And I've talked about the three scenarios. So I'm gonna take BC Hydro. So I live right around here in Kitsilano. Okay, um, BC Hydro's head office, that is the hydro for all of British Columbia in Canada. They're downtown Vancouver. I, we're, we're just arbitrarily making this up. We don't know where their operation center is. It could be on the North Shore, it could be out in Burnaby, it could be somewhere else. But let's, for, for instance, take this as a case where hydro can centralize it into one site. In that scenario, what do we have to do? Well, people have got to drive in from Burnaby, drive in over here from, from way over 
and, and you've got to hit all this traffic to get into downtown Vancouver. It takes you an hour, two hours. If there's an earthquake, all of these bridges are going to be down. You're not going to be able to make it here. Okay. So you're going to have to go and, and travel somewhere else, or you're going to have to have another op center somewhere to go and do that. So where else could you set up another op center? Okay. Well, we can start going, putting one in the North Shore, what we call the North Shore, North Vancouver. We can go and put these other ones down into other areas of the city where they're all in different geographic areas, closer to where people live. Do they need to be as big as this one called BC Hydro Central Office? Nope. They may only need three operators in there. So in different geographies, we deal with that. In Southern Ontario, we worked with one of the regional governments and they basically had a challenge of taking one field crew from the north of the city to the south of the city and during rush hour traffic, it would take two and a half hours for the crew to get there. So it's like, well, let's go and create three field operation sites and let's, central, let's go and look at dispatching between those. And what we created was resiliency in the network. We created three different dispatching facilities, spare parts in those areas, three different areas where the crews could go in the morning, do their site rallies, get their materials, and then go out to their work. And they started becoming within the region and zone. Better for the field crews because they were home on time. They didn't have to commute an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half at evening. And it started saving on the gas and everything else that was required to move the field crews around. Okay, so that's kind of gives us this kind of model where we have those different locations and those just like we use field crews where the field crews are, we can also start creating these different dispatch centers. Do they need to be high expensive real estate like in downtown Vancouver where Amazon, Microsoft, SAP all reside with their really funky offices? Nope. If we're down in some of these other areas, the office space is less expensive, lower cost, closer where people live. It's on transit, so people can get there if they choose to use transit, or they could be biking to work. Okay, now what about if we want to go to a fully distributed model? Ah, now we can start moving to people's homes, or even into smaller and smaller spaces that we might share with a couple of other local governments or other types of organizations. So if we think about it, who has the same security requirements as the hydro utility, the water utility? So down here in, in one of these areas, we have one city government that's running water distribution network, a gas, uh, a, a, different, uh, a different wastewater system, and a transportation grid. We have another one over here called Vancouver, another one called Burnaby, another one called North Shore. And then you've got Hydrowood overlays it. Can they share office space? Sure, especially if it's all segregated. Can they share a network hub? Yep, and you can even segregate out the networks using what we call virtual LANs. All of these things now create the capabilities to create this fully distributed model. All hypothetical, but now you can share the office space, but share the security requirements of creating that space, create it, and then manage it. Not, not as hot desk, but it could be, where the device itself can be used and it only connects into the control systems that it needs to control in when that user goes in, logs in, uses the camera with the biometrics on it, and uses basically the keyboard loggers to make sure that that person is the right person. So I've talked a lot about key enablers here. What are some of the technologies that you want to consider nowadays? And what are these things that are coming up? So I, I, I'm a, I love being a futurist and thinking about the future. Um, I've, I've always been a, a, a technology and a sci-fi fan. So I remember reading Isaac Asimov's book when I was growing up. Um, and it was always talking about robots. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. When are we gonna get there? And that was like 30 years ago. Well, we are there. Um, things are, technologies are all there today. And the, one of the biggest things I always look at is this whole area of hybrid cloud systems. Are hybrid cloud systems really that much different from mainframe computers? Not really. Um, but what we have now is we're actually gone through a technology wave of going from these big mainframe systems to these microcomputers connected together. And now we're going into this cloud world, which is really bringing all those big systems back into a central facility, but sharing it differently. And we're still trying to control the physical access and that's still what the cloud is, but putting what we call a little bit of more devices out on the edge. So what are those devices out on the edge? How do we connect them in? That's that world of IoT. So Internet of Things, what my, my recommendation always to critical infrastructure users is, don't put anything on the internet, okay? Full stop. 
So we did this, we've always done this in utilities. When we run mobile field courses, we've always used our own, we, we've, we've always used private cellular bandwidth. We didn't use public cell networks. We used a separate bandwidth to dispatch field crews, okay? And we've always used different kinds of methods for the 96 baud to go through and handle um, wireless communications to the field. So still, you can still configure up and use your old private, what we call APN or access private network. Um, you can also start using these 5G networks. So even though these telcos are putting it together, you can overlay a software defined private network on top of it, okay? Um, you can do the same thing with VPNs and private networks. And in a lot of cases, you even wanna run or lease your physical fiber. You, you're, even though everybody talks about wireless, guess what? Wireless still requires a fiber link to the cell tower. So even though we have a 5G network, every building that we put up a 5G tower on still has to be backhauled using a fiber network. That means we still have physical wires out in the field everywhere. Use it, lease part of it. That's part of that private network infrastructure that you use in order to create this. If your utility is a small utility and, a, and, it, and it's basically a, like a private, a, a small public utility, then maybe it was collaboration in, in the United States, as an example, it's a co-op model. So you share the cost of some of that private network with your other co-op operators and you do it. I know one other utility that we worked with that actually owns their own fiber network and they rent it back out to the telcos and they make money from it now as well because they own all the right of way uh, with the water wastewater systems. So they basically use and put on the outside of their pipe a, a conduit that they can run fiber through. So they basically not only are using it for their own private network, but they're also using it as a mechanism to go and make additional cash. So then we start getting into these three other worlds. So predictive analytics, things like when can we predict when a power station is about to fail or, or something is gonna come down to, yes, we can. Can we find a water leak in a water main before the water main bursts? Yes, we can. Do we need to do all that with, uh, with, with invasive uh, monitoring? No, we don't. We can do it all with mathematics and predictive analytics. So we've, we've done projects. We've, we've actually validated the technology. Now it's the next stage of how do you go and get it adopted? So we can start using that, it's using sensors, even those little fiber wires on the outside of water mains are part of the technology that you use to actually go and find leaks in water mains because it manages, the, it manages the, the vibrations and the flow patterns and the sonic waves that are coming out of a leak. But that gives us predictive analytics. And then in the new world, as we start moving more and more with this world that everybody keeps talking about is we start getting into artificial intelligence, which is really, it, it's machine learning, and but you're still going through and it's just learning and adapting to what's happening around it and it's a rules-based system. This AI to me is a, is, is a long way away from being adopted. So it's more of the world of augmented reality or tools and decision support tools that are gonna help make some decision, decisions for the operators. And I always love this whole augmented reality. If you ever watch the Matrix movies and, and other ones, you always think of it as like, they've got glasses on. And when they've got glasses on, that's the first wave. If you're starting to see things in the air of being able to go and touch it, or they've got something, a, a watch, and the watch is now broadcasting up from their watch and you're being able to go through and move things around. That's gonna decrease our need for monitors and it's gonna allow us to see a lot more in a visual world a lot faster. So moving forward here, let's give you a couple of case studies where this is being used today. So transport for London. So we, we actually are part of the provider for managing the, uh, the, the cycle hire network for the city of London. And they run a virtual operations environment. They've got two physical centers where they actually stream data. We, we receive all the data coming in in a private network. It doesn't touch the internet. Uh, it comes from different types of technology, but it could be coming from like, a, there's a fleet management system. There's an asset management system. There's financials. There's smart meters out in the field. There's bike movements and GPS movements. All of that stuff comes along and aggregates into what we call an operational data store. It then is able to go through and feed up applications because it's now all aggregated in one place. We actually calculate all these little indicators for every single one of these dots every minute. And what these dots are then used is, is there, there is a, a, a machine learning algorithm that goes along with it that takes the time of day, the weather that's happening, whether it's raining or not, 
um, what the train schedules are coming in, and it starts to predict when these things, these red, these greens are going to turn into red, which means we need to start moving more bikes there so that when, when the bikes get moved around, and you'll see some of these where you see little trucks in here, and these little trucks are basically dynamically moving, which is the GPS signals on the vehicles for where they are so that the dispatcher can start moving and dispatching all of these field crews around and telling the trucks to go over to the reds or the greens, move some from green station A to, to the reds, and make sure that they're keeping everything nice and leveled off. So that's all part of the Transport for London. Now, now how big is this one? So I'm not sure how many people understand how big bike networks are. It's 25,000 bikes, 12,000 stations. So that's a station is where you actually are going through and dropping the bikes. They're all over the city. It's the largest one and one of the first ones in the world that was there. It's all funded by TFL, Transport for London. And we work with the service provider who moves the crews around. So that's kind of an example. And one of the key things, one of our requirements under this was, how do we go through and make sure that all of those stations on there are, are staying green? And that's part of the job that we have in order to go through and do that. So another project we have underway um, to go improve uh, and, and basically do the virtual operations is an intelligence systems research project. So we've partnered with Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. Um, and it is, uh, Ryerson is 50,000 students in downtown Toronto. And their campus is not in an isolated area. It's all throughout buildings all around the downtown core. So there's a challenge here. How do we go and cover all the buildings, the transportation patterns between the buildings, the utilities that connect them all together, the building information systems that are out there, and can we start looking and creating a method to go and understand going through all the different systems of what's going on, be able to do what we call 3D and 4D modeling. So it uses a concept of a digital campus pilot and we're building a digital twin. So what's a digital twin? It's a virtual world of the whole campus so that you can do what if scenarios on it, okay? It's a normalized set of data. So we're creating what we call taxonomies and ontologies related to all of the utility systems, transportation systems and buildings, and trying to understand how the patterns of use are, and then basically creating little research projects with the university labs where they're going through and say, hey, I've got the architecture group is working on specific things of doing 4D BIM modeling of putting HVAC sensors inside rooms and seeing if they can go through, and this is where the validation of doing dynamic set pointing of alerts and alarms on the HVAC system comes into play. So those are the kinds of things that we all start putting together related to a research project. We're doing all this, so we know it's all possible. The key thing that we keep validating is how do we lock it all down? How do we secure it? How do we make sure it never touches the internet? Okay, while the internet's a great thing, I love a comment that uh, one of our partners said, it was a, a large data center provider who runs a global network and a global set of data centers. And he says, with the cloud exchanges that we have in all of these data centers throughout the world, it's an intentional network, it's not an internet. So the intentional network is our organization can choose to be part of a private consortium or a private group of trusted partners to share data, similar to what we do in supply chains. But in that case, it's all going to go through a, a very tightly secured environment for who can get in, what you can monitor, where you can use it, and make sure that it's not actually being used by anything and there's no devices that are from the internet attached to it. So how do you get started with something like a virtual operations center? Or start doing things of work from home and be able to do that? Well, you can work with our R&D team. You can start a pilot project. Um, we, are, we, we have access, as an example, to proof of concept funding from our research projects that we have underway. Um, so we have those. Uh, we also have access to our research networks and research teams um, to provide uh, co-funding or, or proof of concept funding for different projects. Any size, large or small. Ryerson project, as an example, is a, is a multi-million dollar project, five years long. So we started that one in January. It's going for the next five years. Um, things that we've done in the way of real production systems, bicycle rental network is live. It was a small one. Relatively speaking, it's big for them, but it's a city scale environment, so it's big. 
but it doesn't touch all of the infrastructure. It's only one element. It's just bicycles, okay? Or you can start with a building. Start with any type of streaming data and say, I'm going to start with a building. We actually started two years ago with just doing buildings. We had a vision for a smart city. We realized that it's very difficult to go and get city people at the full scale of what you can do here. So we start with single utilities or start with a building environment and a facilities manager. But there's all those different ways of starting a pilot project. So give you a little example, what, what, what some of our customers, not too much of a sales pitch, hopefully I've got a lot of education here today. Um, we have worked with, uh, and we do all kinds of things to help customers move this path. And we've worked with a, with a handful of both US and Canadian and UK based organizations, all in the transportation, um, facilities management, electric, gas, pipeline businesses, um, and in different areas. So. We, we, know our, we know what we're working on when we're working on critical infrastructure. We've been advising and consulting on this for over 30 years and we're continuing to help organizations make the transition to using this new world of technology to manage both remote work from home as well as this new distributed world of plant operations. With that side, I'll leave it open and see if there's any questions and answers that we want to address here. And Carla, if you wanna come in and share any, that would be helpful yeah. to uh, help me coordinate and keep this on schedule. <laughs> Yes, okay, so we have a fair few here. Um, so the first one is, do you think there is a good chance AI program applications can be able to monitor state critical infrastructure? infrastructure? State or critical infrastructure AI systems? Yeah. I would say yes, there is, but it's not, when we say AI, it's going to be more of, um, assisted decision making and that's not because the technology won't be able to do it it's because that the adaption or the requirement to basically be part of it is probably going to say are we willing to go through and let an AI control us I think that's more it's, it's more of a social question is the technology going to be able to do it we already have that in in the way of robotic systems today um, but it comes down to, we're probably going to be seeing over the next 10 years more subsystems being able to have some sort of automated control and AI based with a little bit of rule calculation, but you're not going to basically turn over the keys to that. I think it's going to take time just basically testing validation and everything else. And you're always going to want a human involved in a decision making, especially in a critical emergency. Okay, great. Um, okay. So we've got quite a few questions. This is great. Um, uh, Stephen asks, identify electric utilities who are actively using remote monitoring, um, analysis, control of electric utility generation, um, transmission distribution, DERs. Are you aware of any electric distribution cooperatives who are doing this? I'm not sure if you can answer that one, Mark. Um I, I, I can't say on the electric distribution cooperatives. Um, the, the key thing is, is the cooperatives are usually the, uh, the least funded of the utility group, which means they always have a bit of a challenge and their adoption cycles may be a little bit, a little bit slower. That's because of the money. I, I remember having a conversation just uh, a month ago with an organization over on Vancouver Island and they're like, can we go through and do this? It was a water utility and water and, and, and wastewater. And they said, you know, it's too new for us. Um, it's a little bit of, of remembering back to the way when we had mainframe computers and mini computers and they're saying cloud computing and all of this networking stuff is too advanced for us yet. Co-ops, there's different ones. Um, there's a group in the United States called the Innovations Group, which is a local city governments that are innovators in the use of technology. And they, are, they definitely have certain organizations that were down in the Florida and Georgia area that had some very innovators down there. I'd, I'd want to go and look at those, but I do know it's not one of co-ops or anybody. It's usually by the leader in the organization, the budget availability, and whether they basically have, have got the vision to go through and be a leader in that. Okay, great. And I think the last question, oh, there's two questions here. <laughs> I think we're running, we're running a bit late, so I'm just going to pick one. Is cybersecurity threat a true risk if it's, if you're, if not totally secure from the connected world. I'm not quite sure I understand that. I think it means that 
is cybersecurity a risk if you're not if you're not connected to the internet? Um, cybersecurity is always a threat because of this thing called social engineering. So the way that cybersecurity and hackers try to get access is not necessarily through um, hacking a firewall. It's by trying to get you to respond to an email, giving your credentials freely to them, and then allowing them to get in. So one of the biggest things that we always try to push everybody to educate on, and our shop knows this as well, is don't ever respond to emails. In fact, I actually recommend don't even put your email system on the same systems as your control systems. So they should be on separate PCs as an example, because emails are the ones that are the things that are a main inflection point or any sort of communications. Um, so yes, there is, because of the social engineering aspect, you wanna do that. So there's always protocols around that. That's even when physical systems inside environment are being used, okay? Because, you know, people walk through the front door. Um, Eric Snowden, they call him a hacker. He walked in the front door. He walked out the front door. He didn't hack into the environment, okay? Okay, well, I think that's it for questions. Um, we are right on 12 now, so conscious of everyone's time, we, we may want to move on. So this is the, um, this webinar is part of a series. It's the fifth in our remote control series. So just before everyone leaves, I'd like to let you know that if you'd like to be updated on future events, you can head to the um, remote control page that's on the screen there and subscribe and you'll be notified of the next webinar. Uh, or we'd also love for you to stay in touch with us on LinkedIn or on Twitter. We're regularly posting updates there. You'll find out about our next events, any new content we've produced. You can also reach out and ask us questions. We'd love to hear from you. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this morning. It was, I really enjoyed this presentation and um, some really great questions. So I'll be in touch. We'll be sharing the copy of this slide, uh, this presentation with you um, afterwards. Thanks everyone.